This is Joanne Carion Reyes conducting my first interview with Rob Rowland at the Susanna Dickinson Museum in Austin, Texas on Saturday, June 28th. This interview is part of the Conversation to Create Unity Oral History Project conducted by the Susanna Dickinson Museum and Baylor University. So we're going to have this conversation and um, just want to start off hearing a little bit about you. Um, maybe, you know, tell us um, when and where you were born, a little bit about growing up. Okay. I was born January 7th, 1993 in Austin, born and raised there. I'm from the south side of Austin, just Manchac and Ben White. Uh, growing up, it was a very different neighborhood than what it is now. It was a lot more uh, Latino neighborhood. We had a, I lived on a dead end street, and so to my right, there were all Latinos. We had a few white neighbors, but then when I was about mm, 14, 15, the city came in and built some new houses, and they were very upscale houses. So nowadays, we have a lower to middle class section where I live and then very upper middle class just right maybe 10 steps from where I am. Tell me a little bit more about your family. My family, I live with my mom right now. She was born in Veracruz, Mexico. She moved to New Jersey when she was 18 and she lived there for a few years. She met her second husband there and then they decided to move back to the south, back in uh, Texas, to be closer to her family in Mexico. As she lived here, they moved from, I think, the east side of town down to the south where we're at now, and uh, she became a teacher. So my family, aside from my oldest brother who was born in Mexico, all of them have been born here, so we're all first generation. So how many brothers and sisters, tell, tell us about the makeup of your family. I have three siblings. Uh, two older brothers and one sister. The oldest brother was born in Mexico. My sister was born. My sister and brother were both born here, and they're all quite a ways older than me. My oldest brother is thirty-seven, thirty-eight. Then my sister is thirty-five, and then my brother closest to me is thirty. So we have quite a gap between us. Tell us a little bit about um, your early life, like going to school, maybe start off with elementary school and all, up through all your schooling. Elementary school started, there was a little bit of, of trouble placing me in elementary school. I'm not sure why. I just started school and they wanted to put me in a bilingual class. My family arguing that just because the family speaks Spanish at home, I'm not bilingual. I speak English fluently, but they put me in a bilingual class my first semester of kindergarten, and then my mom had to go and argue with the principal, put me in the English-speaking class, and that's where I stayed until second grade, and there was no problem. Then in third grade, again, for some reason, they put me in the bilingual class, and I never understood it. For me, it didn't seem out of the ordinary to have to be speaking Spanish with my friends because that's just how I grew up. I wasn't good at it, but, you know, it's how I grew up. And then after that, my mom had to go back and say, he's not a bilingual student. English is his first language, so I was back in that. And then that's pretty much where I stayed for all of school. I went to middle school and I was asked, you know, what class, what second language do you want to take? I took Latin because I already spoke Spanish. I didn't need to be concerned with that. When I started high school is when I really started to find my own passion, so I started doing theater. And from there that segued into film, which is where I am now in college, studying film directing and editing. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, just any experiences maybe that you had. Uh, you know, you mentioned you grew up, um, you grew up in the South Side, and there was, um, you said something about that it was mainly a Latino community, and then upscale houses were built. Um, so how did that? Did you see any other than having Anglo's move in? Did you see any change, or what did you experience when? that change happened in your neighborhood that you can recall? It was very different in the sense that we didn't have a sense of community anymore because with the big field, the lot where, you know, we had nothing, it was the neighborhood across the way and my neighborhood, so we didn't have anything connecting us. And so it was my neighbors in front of me. We would eventually, we'd talk to each other once in a while, and then, you know, the neighbors to the right, we'd all get together every once in a while and talk. But then once the street opened up, 
the, uh, the new neighbors, they kind of wanted to be more social with each other. So they would start, you know, you'd see them going over to each other's houses, just walking in and out. And uh, eventually that spread over into, into our side. And while we were initially a little bit hesitant about that because we didn't trust them, we didn't know who they were, nowadays it's like, you know, we walk over there and we're happy to see them. And they, they brought in some, some levity because my neighborhood was predominantly an older neighborhood. I was one of maybe two houses that had kids. And so that was just, it was me and the neighbor kids who would play with each other. The rest were, I would say, upper 30s and, you know, going on to middle age from there. But now we have families with younger kids coming in, and it's nice to see the streets being played in or see people, you know, coming in and out to ride their bikes. And it's a very, it's a very active neighborhood now, and I, I think it's better for it. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about your... Um Maybe perhaps uh, you spoke about elementary school and, and going in and out of bilingual classrooms and more or less having to insist that you were a um, you had you know ability to speak English. How did your ability to speak Spanish perhaps either help or not help as you got, went up through middle school and high school? It was one of those things that it never really it didn't come up often. Because once people learned that I spoke English, and with, the, with my name being Roland, nobody assumed that I could speak mm -hmm. Spanish at all. So my friends were predominantly white, and you know my friends who were Latino didn't think I could speak Spanish. They thought I was very ignorant about my culture. It's just, no, we all speak English to each other in school. And at, when I went to school still, up until I think right about my junior year of high school, the climate was very much, you don't speak Spanish in school. Mm -hmm. You have to speak English. So we didn't do it, but it, as we got older, you know, amongst ourselves, and now especially in college, we jump back and forth between the language because we can. It's acceptable. And one particular story I remember that my Spanish speaking really came in handy was when I was my senior year of high school, we had a Spanish uh, transfer student come in. He was spending a semester in the United States. And he came in, sat in my class, and the teacher wanted to know if someone could translate for him what we were doing. And I was surprised to find out that I was the only Spanish speaker in the class. And so I sat down with him and I told him about the assignment. I think we were reading Hamlet at the time, so I had to basically translate Hamlet for him. And I found out that translating Shakespeare into a different language is really hard, and then translating Shakespeare into a different dialect, because his Spanish was totally different from mine, was a bit of a challenge. But he and I became friends because he was like, the only person I can communicate in here is this kid who claims he can speak Spanish, but it's very different than the one he spoke, so. Okay, um, how about on into college, since we're kind of on an education thought here. How, uh, talk about your college career. I know you, um, you mentioned you got involved in theater and then film, so talk perhaps a little bit about your experience in theater, and then we'll move on to film. Well, I'm studying theater right now at Texas State, and walking in, I told them right away that I wanted to be a director, and I knew, even at 18, that I had a rare opportunity, because of my cultural background, to explore that, and, you know, I, I grew up in a bilingual theater company, so I knew that, like, I had that chance to explore it, and I knew that there weren't that many kids like me in the department, so when it came time, I think it was my second year of college, I was in my first directing class, and they gave us the opportunity to direct any show we wanted, I said I wanted to direct a bilingual show. And I was a little bit hesitant about it, but my professor said, he's like, no, you know what, that's something that needs to be done because we have kids who always want to do, you know, the classics. They want to do their Shakespeare. They want to do anything that's not their cultural identity. And the fact that you're doing that is opening the gates for us to do that. And uh, it actually, it went over really well. People loved it, and I thought that perhaps because it was going to be there were going to be Spanish words in it that people weren't going to follow it, but I got people who said they didn't speak a word of Spanish, but they were like, I understood what they were saying because of the context. And so I found that's what I need to explore more, teaching people to communicate, not through the words, but through mm -hmm. the emotion of what's going on between them. What kind of feedback did you get on uh, an academic level um, from your class or from, you know, your classmates perhaps at New Theater or your professor who... Well, that was the... Uh, that was the interesting about it, that undergrads tend to not want to take directing classes. So I went in there, and I was 19, sitting in a class full of 23-year-old and grad students, people who had experience in theater way more than I did. And I would 
call my professor maybe once a week telling him I, I didn't feel like I should be in the class. I was freaking out. I was like, can you just drop me because I'm not ready for this at all? But he would, very patient man, sat down and said, you know, I had to interview everyone who wanted to be in this class. And I knew that you were an undergrad. I knew you were young, but you fit in here. And then I sat down with him again and I was like, I think I made the wrong choice in play because, you know, making this cultural identity play right now in my career, I don't feel like I'm, I can handle the material. And plus everyone else is doing this very introspective, dramatic plays and I'm doing a farce. Mm. I feel like I'm undermining all their work. And he says, he said, you know what, we'll sit down and we'll talk about it after the show is over. And he came back and he said, you produce one of the funniest plays I've seen an undergrad do. You understand comedy and you understand it because the subject material relates to you. And it was pretty much unanimous in one class. They were, they all said that it was one of the funniest things they'd ever seen. And so I've, I felt I did a good job and that's where I found my niche now, just doing cultural comedies. Mm -hmm. So have, um, we're interested in, I think in this project in people, you know, sharing any other experiences where they feel their particular culture. <clears throat> um, either had an impact on the community, either, you know, positively or negatively, or are there any stories you'd like to share about about either your work in theater or your work in film or just your life in general where you felt like um, the fact that you're Latino was um, something that, that was very much in the forefront of your experience? I definitely feel now that on campus people are kind of using me as their... I don't want to say token Latino, but I am definitely their go-to guru, if you will, on the culture. And it's funny because I know there are other people in the department who are more involved or who, have, who came from another country who could tell them more, but the fact is they, I think it's because they went to school here, they understand that you have to hide that part of your culture, whereas the way I was trained, it's like, no, you have to celebrate your culture mm -hmm. because you're different and because if you don't, no one else is going to and it's going to die with you. So I feel for sure that people sometimes will see me, they'll see me wearing, you know, my Teatro Vivo shirt around and they'll want to know more about it. Or they'll think that's, that's all I am. They'll think that that's just the only kind of theater I'll do. And I'll say, no, like that's, that's the jumping off point for me. That's where I started. And that's the lens that I view the theater through that I view all art through. But it allows me to expand on other things and say, how is it different? And how is it the same to me? Because I'll find that there's a lot more similarities between different cultures and there are differences if you just... Mm -hmm. Look at them properly. Do you um, has your family been supportive of you? Um, you know, in, in terms of you talked about celebrating your culture. Can you talk about perhaps was that something that your family valued, or was that something you had to like uh, really fight for in your family to to be able to do that? How was culture viewed? I have to say, my family has adored the way I've taken my life the past couple of years because you know being. 21st century kid it was you know school taught me it's like you hide that part of your culture so it was I would go to school and speak English and then I'd come home and I'd demand that we speak at home and that's because you know that's what they told me at school and then right around the time I was 14 15 I saw that no like I can I can do both no one's there's not a crime there's not a law against that and so my family saw a definite change in my behavior and I think they celebrated it more and I think it's affected us more because growing up it was always you know Mexican at home American at school, American mm -hmm. in public, and that's just the way we were taught. But nowadays, between all of us, not just my immediate family, but everyone who comes in contact with us, it's like, no, we can switch back and forth between both, or we can be both at the same time, mm -hmm. because there's not one definition of American culture. It's the way you adapt it. Mm -hmm. If we live here, we are American culture. Mm -hmm. So now that you're branching out into film, so is that is that beyond the educational um institution of, of Texas State. Tell, talk about film and maybe talk a little bit about how being a Latino involved in film has impacted you or, or, or the experiences you've had in film. I mean, being from Austin, being a filmmaker, being Latino, you're always going to be overshadowed by Robert Rodriguez, <laughs> which, is, which is what I'm being faced with. Everyone says, are you going to do his kind of work? Do you want to work for him? Of course, who wouldn't want to work for Robert Rodriguez? But his flavor is not my flavor. I want to create my own kind of sauce, if you will, because he did what was right for him. And 
for me, it's not so much about doing, for one, hyper-violent movies. For me, it's about having characters who are Latino, having a story that is, at its core, a Latino story, but not making it exclusively Latino. I want it to be accessible to everyone. Because when you watch a Rodriguez film, it's very much like you're watching a Latino film, someone who is immersing himself in the culture and he's shooting it off with fireworks versus I want to be like, no, it's not. All of us are together. You'll have a Latino front. You'll have a Latino lead, but he's not a stereotype in any way. He is part of that culture in the film. And that's what I feel. I'm very much against whitewashing in films now. I feel like the world doesn't look like that. You're going to, if you go into any bus stop, you go to any restaurant, you're going to see a large amount of people from different cultures sitting around talking to each other. So why shouldn't our art reflect that? So, um, wow. So let's talk about, um, what your life is like now. Um, just kind of maybe talk a little bit about what, what's a day in the life of, of Rob Rowland, um, in terms of, um, what you do, what, um, the people you meet and perhaps any stories that relate to <clears throat> being Latino, you know, like what is, what is it like to be in your skin on a daily basis? What do you, what do you encounter? My typical day would consist of waking up pretty early, just about when the sun will start to come up. I'll get myself a good workout in and then I'll come out. My parents will be waking up around that time. So my mom will be there and uh, she'll want to offer me a breakfast. And while I love my culture, I will say, Latino cuisine, not totally the healthiest to be eating. So I'll have to politely decline and make myself a protein shake, which is difficult to do when you're seeing someone eat, you know, chorizo. <laughs> but, you know, it must be done. I'll go on from there to do a little bit of work on my films, either in some form of editing or writing. And then my friends will call me and they'll want to do something. And if I have time to do that, then I'll go out and typically will go do something physically active. So we'll do climbing or kayaking. Kayaking, I'm a huge fan of. And then for lunch, it's typically where my Latino does come out. <laughs> because right around the time, I miss, I miss the chorizo. I miss the barbacoa for breakfast. So can I please get a taco or something? <laughs> because I'm not at home and I want it. After that, it'll probably be back to work. I'd say I'm back in the editing lab working on some film writing. That's actually probably 90% of my day. Dinner time will come around and then I'll be back with my friend probably at the bar and we'll be discussing even more projects to work on. Okay. So let me see. Anything else that, that you want to talk about in terms of perhaps your work out in the community or anything else just, that you just want to get a chance to talk about for this interview that you want to record for posterity. Prosperity. Posterity. 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 Yeah. Um, I think one of the things people tell me more often than not is that I have a tendency, if I see someone that needs my help, I tend to just go running and not ask questions for it. And sometimes, you know, I don't do it as often as I would like, but I do try to carry some water bottles, especially now in the summer, in my car. And, you know, I'll go out when I have the time and I'll go and I'll give them to people I see on the street who are, you know, you know, who is, who is always outside, whether they're working, they have a job that requires them to be outside or people who are homeless or just people who spend way too much time outside, you know, that like they do appreciate getting that water and they appreciate knowing that someone has their back. And there's been, you know, times where I've sat down with people that I see at the park, people that I'll be, you know, kayaking next to, and I'll just sit down and I'll offer them some of my food because I think... I like to do something like this where I'm interviewing them for my own sake, knowing their story because everyone has a story they like to tell. And I feel like sharing a water bottle with them opens, it drops their guard a little bit so I can get to learn them. And I feel like as a person, it helps me grow. If I learn about my neighbor, if I learn about, you know, my new friend, but it also helps me rather selfishly. It helps me as an artist because I can be like, Oh, this person had an interesting story. I can take that and adapt it a little bit. And then it gives me an edge a bit in storytelling. So I'd say, help people because then that helps you. Thank you very much, Rob.